It took just 11 years to go from the first flight of the Lancaster bomber in 1941 to the first flight of the VX-770, the prototype Vulcan bomber in 1952. Yet the difference between them could hardly be greater. The Vulcan, along with the Victor and Valiant, were a new generation of planes known as the V-bombers. Planes for a new era and a newly nuclear-armed Britain. In 1945, Britain emerged victorious from the Second World War, financially bankrupt but rich with engineering genius. The nation that had fought off the Luftwaffe, cracked the Enigma code and created radar was flush with a new generation of world-beating engineers and scientists who went to work for the great British aero corporations like Hawker Siddeley, Westland and Vickers Armstrong. War was over but another race was beginning as the Soviets and the Americans jostled to find a new balance of power. The price of a seat at the big boys table soon became clear, an independent nuclear deterrent. In 1947, just five years after the first Lancaster went into service, the British government issued a specification for a new bomber, one which could have a range of up to 3,700 kilometers, 2,300 miles, cruise at 930 kilometers an hour, 580 miles an hour, and at between 35 and 55,000 feet, and also carry a five-ton nuclear bomb. Because they flew so high and fast, they will be out of the range of anti-aircraft weapons and enemy fighters, so they had no active defences like the previous generation of bombers. By 1952, Britain had tested its first atomic bomb in Operation Hurricane, detonating a 25 kiloton device off of Western Australia. But just as the British were celebrating joining the nuclear club, Three weeks later, the Americans tested their first hydrogen bomb, Ivy Mike, some 400 times more powerful. Prime Minister Winston Churchill ordered that Britain should have its own H-bomb by 1957, and the V-bombers would be the delivery system, with the first H-bomb test being airdropped by a Valiant bomber. Back in 1947, the government put the tender out to three companies, Avro, Hanley Page and Vickers Armstrong. It was a demanding specification. The old designs of a propeller-driven aircraft were not up to the job, but the knowledge of high-speed designs were equally lacking too. At Avro, based in Manchester, the company which had built the highly successful Lancaster bomber, a young engineer called Bob Lindley, turned to German swept-wing research that he'd seen on a trip to Germany just after the Second World War. At first, Lindley's design was dismissed, but upon further investigation, it was found that the delta wing had significant advantages. By enclosing the engine in the wing structure, an aircraft could have a reduced drag and high stability without too much weight. Lindley would later go to America to work on the Gemini program and the space shuttle, but his sketch became a reality the all-British Avro and was named by their technical director, Roy Chadwick, after the Roman god of fire, Vulcan. The Delta Wing design pioneered by the Vulcan would also go on to be used in Concorde and the Space Shuttle. But the Vulcan wasn't the only futuristic bomber being designed by the British at the time. The UK government also awarded a contract to Hanley Page, who'd built the Second World War Halifax bomber. Their proposed aircraft, named Victor, also used an advanced wing design described as a crescent and, like the Vulcan, had its engines mounted in the wing. It was also the most technologically advanced electronic plane in the world at the time. But the government had learnt from the war that it was better to spread the risk when dealing with new technology. So the third contract went to Vickers Armstrong, selected as the insurance option. Their design was considerably less advanced than the Vulcan or the Victor, but promised to come in at under budget and on time. Sure enough, Vickers delivered ahead of schedule, and in May 1951, the Valiant was the first of the three to make it into the skies, putting pressure on Avro and Hanley Page to deliver. Production models of the Valiant were delivered in early 1955, with the first Vulcan the following the next year, and the Victor by the end of 1957. When the prototype Vulcan and Victors appeared at air shows in the early 1950s, they were keen to show off their capabilities, performing barrel rolls, a manoeuvre previously unthinkable and unbecoming of a bomber aircraft. But the V-bombers were unlike anything the world had seen before. They were rewriting the book on the jet age. The V-bombers not only impressed the public, but also friend and foe alike. 
The Vulcan's Delta Wing gave it a high altitude performance but allowed it to turn tighter than the swept wing fighters of the day like the Lightning and the MiG-15. It also made other bombers like the new B-52 look positively sloth-like in comparison. The V bombers were invited to the US for bombing competitions. Planes would fly for hours at night to a simulated target, usually a city like Tucson, Salt Lake City or Los Angeles. There they would drop simulated nuclear bombs, not real devices, but by using electronics they could calculate the accuracy of a drop. The V bombers consistently achieved within 500 meters accuracy, whilst the B-52s had quite a lot larger errors. As the V bombers began arriving at RAF bases around the UK, the new squadrons went into immediate high alert. As the Failingdale's radar scanned the skies for ballistic missiles, the procedure was for 200 V bombers to be in the air within four minutes before the Soviet missiles landed. QRA or Quick Reaction Alert crews trained around the clock for three levels of readiness, 15 minutes, five minutes, and just two minutes. Under this highest two minute alert, the bombers would sit at the end of the runway, fueled and with the engines running. In total, 136 Avro Vulcans, 86 Hanley Page Victors, and 107 Vickers Valiants were built. All were originally painted in anti-flash white to reflect some of the radiation from a nuclear blast. Although the V-bombers never carried out the nuclear strike mission they were designed for, the Valiant has the distinction of being the only one of the three to drop a live nuclear device, as they were part of Britain's nuclear test program. But around this time, the destiny of the V-bombers would also change. In 1957, a defense white paper announced that ballistic missiles would be Britain's new nuclear delivery system. Advances in surface-to-air missiles meant that the V-bombers were suddenly vulnerable. There was no longer a safe high altitude. Instead, the best option would be to climb to a high-level flight over Western Europe, descending to fly just above ground level through the Eastern Bloc, and then climbing again before reaching their targets. The bombers were repainted with a camouflaged upper side to fit the new mission profile. However, the V-bombers were not designed to fly fast at low altitudes. The denser air and increased turbulence caused fatigue cracks on the Vickers Valiant, which were so bad that they had to be formally retired in 1965. The Victors also suffered from fatigue problems. Although not as bad as the Valiant, they were also withdrawn from nuclear service by 1968. As missiles replaced bombers in the late 1960s, some of the surplus Victors were converted into reconnaissance planes and refueling tankers, leaving just the Vulcan in the prime bomber role. By 1982, the first and last time that the Vulcan bombers would see active service, they were about to be retired, with much of their equipment looking almost as dated as the Lancasters they replaced in the 1950s. Much of their navigational equipment would have easily been recognizable by World War II bomber pilots. Their last mission was to bomb the Port Stanley airfield in the Falklands. This would entail the longest ever bombing run at the time, flying 5,800 miles or 12,600 kilometers from Ascension Island in the Atlantic to the Falklands in the South Atlantic over open ocean in Operation Black Buck. Three Vulcans were chosen with the more powerful Bristol Olympus 301 engines and supported by 11 Victor tankers flying in relays. The distance was so far that the forward Victor tankers had to be refueled in mid-air themselves. The single attacking Vulcan used 50,000 gallons of fuel and needed refueling five times during the missions. Seven Black Buck missions were planned, but only five were carried out. Even though the missions had been a success, for the Vulcans, their time was up. The last ones being retired from active service in 1984. The plane that had been a technological tour de force in the 1960s and that made the B-52 look old fashioned, itself had become out of date. And unlike the modular construction of a B-52, it couldn't be updated in the same way. One was kept as a display plane, XH-558 and continued with the RAF until 1993. In 1997, it was bought by a private company and restored and toured the country attending air shows. In fact, this piece of footage I shot at my local Clapton air show, but in 2015, it ceased flying 
due to it being increasingly difficult to find the skilled service personnel and the withdrawal of support by the original manufacturers. However, it is still able to accelerate on the runway at its Doncaster Sheffield Airport base. The Hanley Page Victor was the one which lasted the longest with the final converted tankers being retired in 1993. The V-Bombers were built to shock and amaze the world, to do the unthinkable, and they did it right up until their final mission. So thanks for watching, and I'd just like to say that this episode's shirt was the Tabla Paisley by Madcap England, and is available from atomretro.com with worldwide shipping from here in the UK. Don't forget that we also have the Curious Droid Facebook page, and I'd also like to thank all of our patrons for their ongoing support. And if you're interested in becoming a patron, then please click on the link now showing. So again, thanks for watching, and please subscribe, rate, and share.